Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show and the communications director for Crucible Leadership. You have clicked play on, uh, we hope, really, we hope you've clicked subscribe to a podcast that deals in crucible experiences. That's the name that we give to those failures and setbacks, tragedies, um, those things that happen in our lives that can knock the wind out of us, that can take the wind out of our sails, that very often change the entire trajectory of our lives. But here's the good news. We don't talk about them so you know we sit around the campfire and trade war stories and feel sorry for ourselves or wallow in where we're, we're uh, struggling. We talk about them here to offer hope that those moments can indeed be overcome and not just survived, but they can be thrived through. They can lead you to a new and rewarding life if you learn the lessons of them and apply them to your life. And um, all of that construct uh, comes from both the mind and the experience of the host of the show and the founder of Crucible Leadership, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, um, we've got a, this is interesting. We've got a good one today because you were just on his podcast a little while ago. So it's kind of fun. I'm like the guy left out. I wasn't in the first one and now I'm trying to you know, catch up. <laughs> Absolutely, Gary. Very much looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. Um, so listeners, you know, uh, when we um, we bring a guest in, we, we ask them to give us a biography. And I, you know, say, try to keep it under 200 words. And here's, here's the truth. Not a lot of people keep it under 200 words. But today's guest did indeed keep it under 200 words. So bravo for, for being a, you know, for following the guidelines, but also just summing up very succinctly uh, what he does. And that today's guest is Kevin Edwards. And here's his biography. Kevin Edwards is the host of the Real Leaders podcast, a top 100 U.S. business news podcast and director of operations at Real Leaders. Drop the mic. That's it. Um, that's all we need uh, to to know by way of introduction. Warwick, take it away and uh, dig deeply in in conversation with the man who interviewed you not too long ago. Absolutely. Well, Kevin, it's wonderful to have you uh, here on the podcast. I loved being on your podcast, Real Leaders, and uh, boy. Uh, you are so good at being a podcast host. The depth of questions that you asked, as I was mentioning off air, the clip that you had of me, one of the, maybe one, if not the best clip I think I've ever, we've ever had. So it was great. Love to, you know, so thank and you for I'm coming the on the podcast. The, I'm the guy who picks the clips <laughs> for the episode. So thanks for that, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> like it went up, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Kevin said the bar high, so no yes. pressure, but, uh, well, yeah. And just the whole concept of real leaders, uh, just looking at what's on your website and I kind of love what you have here. Real leaders is dedicated to elevating and accelerating the global impact movement in order to inspire wise solutions to, to the issues that matter most. I mean, just, that whole concept of, of what it takes to be a real, real leader is more than just success, as we talked about in our last conversation. But before we get to kind of uh, real leaders and what you do now, tell us a bit about Kevin Edwards, you know, where you grew up, sort of like the background that led you to really get involved in podcasting and real leaders, sort of what's the, connect the dots for us about your background and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, thanks, Warwick. And yeah, Gary, I'll go on the same point because I get those guests that come on the show that always give me those long bios. And <laughs> I know. Really, when I was starting now, it was just so awkward just reading these bios, just touting them. Like, how about they just tell me, you know, who who they are? Right. That's why I just want to give you something short and sweet. And I am the the host of the Leaders Podcast, where you know leaders keep it real, of course. <laughs> um, but I started out um, really as an intern for Real Leaders. Uh, they, at the time, I think had four employees, so fairly small company, small businesses, love small businesses. And the founder came to me and he said, hey, would you mind kind of writing some stories on some social entrepreneurs? I said, "Social? what are social entrepreneurs? I had no idea what they were. I was into entrepreneurship at the time. I had my own like, you know, pressure washing business, you know, going to local, you know, neighbors and asking them if I could 
pressure wash their deck or driveway for a couple of bucks in the summer. And then, uh, yeah, this internship opportunity came about and I said, well, Mark, you know, that's great. I like write, certainly write some stories. I'm not really that good of a writer, but you know, for young reader leaders, not that many people our age are reading magazines nowadays. You know, this is the time when Facebook just rolled out their videos. So I had one of my best friends on campus. I went to the university of Arizona and, um, one of my best friends on campus was like the, the philanthropic video editor would do all those fun, cool little videos. And he was the best. I mean, he had the whole campus swag going on. Everyone was rocking his shirts. Everyone wanted to be in part of their videos. So I said, Hey, how about we make business cool? How about I go out and interview, you know, some of these social entrepreneurs and really just get to understand and learn what they do. So I think I was telling Gary before the show, you know, I just went up the, um, the West coast with him and his, his car after a uh, sophomore year and we're, you know, no budget whatsoever. We just told Mark, Hey, just give us a shot. So we ran some, you know, basic equipment on Amazon. I'm sure we're all trying to figure out microphones. I've got a nice setup here now, but it wasn't this way before it was a couple of lapel mics that worked, you know, one every 10 times and <laughs> you had a camera and Keep in mind, I'm I'm six three, and we're doing these these walking interviews. So my buddy, you know Tucker, he's holding this camera up here. He's about five nine. So you know, after we thought, you know, we were biting off more than we could chew. We're doing about ten interviews a day with these social entrepreneurs, thirty minutes each. So you know, by the end of the summer, you know, Tucker has some ripped shoulders there. Yeah. Um, but and yeah. you told me when we uh, talked in advance of this interview that you stayed while you were on that road trip, you stayed at some five-star accommodations. Uh, I think you indicated you slept where? So first stop, <laughs> first stop was, uh, well, actually it was San Diego and we had a good time there. And then we went up to San Francisco from San Diego because Tucson's about five and a half hours away from San Diego. San Diego to San Francisco is another eight hours. And we stopped at his friend's place from high school, played on the baseball team there. In San Francisco, it's my really first time in the city. So we're in this these bay window apartments, right? And they're USF. And we're on the lower level of that apartment. <laughs> and I remember asking this guy's like, how much are you paying in money? He's like, I'm paying like $2,100 for this little lower level. So I'm like, oh, great. He set this air mattress for us, you know, in the living room floor. How nice of him. And then there's another mattress to the side. Oh, great. So we've had a long road trip. We're rehearsing, you know, trying to do our elevator pitch. You know, real leaders, we reached 30,000 CEOs in 135 countries, you know, control $6 trillion to spend. Yeah. And we're pretty tired. I say, hey, Tuck, I need, I need to sleep. So I go into this bed. He goes into the air mattress, get all snuggled in, and his roommate <laughs> is studying for his test. And I get a text on my phone. He says, hey, Kev. You're in Cooper's bed. I'm paying twenty one hundred dollars to sleep on a mattress in the living room floor. So I got to move back over to the air mattress, which is of course halfway filled up and has a hole in it. So you know, slept on the floor that night and had to do ten interviews the next day. But that's kind of living situations that we were in, and that's kind of the 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 art of learning as you go. And so we did those ten interviews at a Impact Hub in San Francisco. Went up the West Coast to. Portland, Oregon. We went to Bend, Oregon. We went to Seattle, Washington. We went to Vancouver, Washington. We went to the U.S. Virgin Islands. And through that summer, we did about 30, 35 interviews with social entrepreneurs, CEOs, and any sustainable business owner that we get our hands on. And it really taught us a lot. So um, when you say social entrepreneur, what is a social entrepreneur? Yeah, a social entrepreneur to me is someone who is intentionally trying to take on a social or environmental problem. And as they grow, as they scale, they're able to solve that problem even further. I'll give you an example. An example to me is someone who's coming on a show called Emma Rose Cohen. And she had a passion. Uh, she went to University of uh, Santa Barbara, you know, school on the coast, saw there's a ton of plastic everywhere. And said, why is this? Here I am trying to get this great education and we're just polluting, throwing bottles everywhere. And it's really getting into, you know, the waste streams. And we've all seen the image, you know, of the turtle and its nose. And she said, I want to end this problem and does some research. And the problem ends up being single use plastic. Plastic you use after, after one time. Virgin plastic made from oils, right? So she goes out, she does this viral video. And this video 
she throws on to a crowdfunding site, raises $1.8 million wow. and is able to now diversify her product line and make for a for-profit company making the final product. These could be utensils, wipes, um, you know, anything that you use one time to eliminate that consumer behavior of throwing away plastic into waste streams that affect our animals, our ecosystems, all the above. So that's a social entrepreneur, someone who's solving also a business problem in a socially constructive way. Wow. So you and your buddies had a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in college. You had this idea. And so was this with real leaders? Like what was then the genesis of it about, you know, doing interviews with social entrepreneurs? Is that kind of partly how it happened? Yeah, real leaders uh, at the time, the tagline was better leaders for a better world. And okay. we focus a lot on diversity and inclusion. And so, you know, hats off to our founder and our leadership team for letting us do this one. But, you know, we we created a good product. I mean, it brought them viewership that they'd never had before uh, online at the time. So and, and, um, and these were video interviews that you're doing. So they didn't have that. So you sort of pitch the idea to them. And uh, I mean, that took a lot of courage at that age, because they were looking for articles, it sounds like, but you pitched them an idea that it might work better with younger folks today. So um, I mean, where do you find that sort of courage and get and get up and go spirit to do all of that? Because a lot of folks in college would not be thinking that would not right. even try it. And then you got to get these interviews with folks, which is not always easy. You know, you're in college. So how did all right. that happen? I mean, where'd you get that sort of the uh, the get up and go, the courage to do all that? Yeah, I mean, there's it's a good question. You know, there's no courage without fear, right? And so had a lot of fear kind of, you know, just starting out, just like, you know, here I am. I don't know a lick about business, but I just wanted to go out there and interview people. I'd had a few prior experiences with interviewing people. I was the anchor of like our high school, you know, news channel. So I kind of had some experience, but really it was just throwing ourselves out there and, and, you know, seeing what happens. And I think a lot of the leaders are those people as well. And I think they recognize people that are different people that are trying to put themselves in an uncomfortable position and they recognize that. And so everyone that, you know, I was able to interview, obviously my terminology, my questions were probably horrible at the time. I probably thought they were good, but you know, it may have not made any sense, but they were willing to work with me and, you know, give me that time. So that's something that I really appreciated. And, and as you do more repetitions, that I'm sure you both have found, you get to be more comfortable. You learn little things along the way that you can't research, right? Things that just come up through continuous repetition. So, you know, I've, I've kind of adopted that mentality in anything I do now, just knowing things are going to take a long time. And that's something that, you know, school and anything else, I don't think could really teach you. Yeah, I mean, I think you're answering this, but maybe to other folks in college or young people starting out, what are the lessons you learned from that epic road trip up the West Coast and pitching an idea, which, I mean, that pitched one idea to you, but you kind of pitched it back to them in a slightly different uh, vein. You know, they weren't looking for video series, but you offered it to them. So what are the lessons you'd, you'd offer for college folks or young people uh, that you learned from that whole experience? Yeah, uh, business owners are more willing to give you their time versus their money. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was a pretty easy sell for us to say, hey, give us 30 minutes of your time and we're going to talk about your career, career path, career advice for young social entrepreneurs, break these videos down into one to three minutes and bring these success stories to life to inspire purposeful careers. Do you have a moment? A lot of them did. And so, um, you know, it was relentless emails, obviously we got rejected a hundred times, but, um, people are very willing, especially people in the, in the impact space, they need that recognition right now. So I think, you know, we, mm -hmm. we definitely fill the gap for them in terms of, uh, getting them some, uh, marketing material out there. So there was some wise strategies there that, you know, business owners is one thing, but folks that want to have a impact, uh, environmentally and socially, they want to get their environment out there. Here's a couple of young guys, you know, it's like, well, these, and you weren't just talking about a whole long phone video. You're talking video clips. You're probably a variety of different things that you could package it. So that was, so that was pretty enterprising. So 
as you go maybe walk back and you mentioned off air you grew up in, in in the portland area was there something in your background parents or something that gave you this entrepreneurial courageous spirit i mean where does that sense of adventure come from uh, well, my mother is the president of Real Leaders, so uh, oh, okay. that's how I was able to get that opportunity, which is very fortunate. Um, and that's the thing, though, you, Warwick, you're, you work in business, you know how. Yeah, I'm pretty, it. pretty, yeah. You yes. don't want to work for your mother. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, in terms of the, my background, I think for entrepreneurship, it really just started out with, you know, like, you know, pressure washing and standing decks. Um, doing something that was different. I mean, I was always very active. I was in student government, high school, I ran on community task force that we started. I was pitching, you know, into, in front of a court to get us more money for our nonprofit at the time when I was super young. So my parents always made me uncomfortable, always threw me into the fire. And I think my dad's favorite quote is to make my life miserable. Like that's his number one job. So <laughs> Um, I, I always grew up in an uncomfortable setting and always had to persevere over a lot of different challenges, whether it was on the sports team, whether it was in family life, like anybody does, I would assume. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, but also maybe environmentally, yeah, growing up in Oregon, you're definitely, I mean, I didn't realize I grew up in a forest until I moved to Tucson, Arizona. Um, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, I mean, definitely being a part of uh, the environment, being close to Mount hood, close to the beach, having force to run around in, I think definitely played a role in that as well. As you tell that story, one of the things that leaps out to me, the very first thing you said to me when we did a, a, a call like a month or so mm. ago now, first thing I wrote down on top of my paper, if you can see it there, is everyone has their own crucible, is what you said. And, and it sounds like what you were just describing, right? Um, um you had your own experiences and the people that you talked to had their own crucible experiences. I mean, it's, 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 as Warwick says, if you haven't had one, check your watch. Cause you know, in, in 15 minutes, you might have one. Uh, but that's a pretty profound statement for this show to say everyone has their own crucible. Yeah, I, I would agree on that. I mean, what Warwick is saying is completely true. And that's really the crux of what has kept me going. Hmm. Interviewing successful social entrepreneurs, CEOs, and you hear these stories about, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have any meaning in my life. My, my kids didn't recognize me anymore. I had this spear in the heart moment where I was so focused on growth and I just lost who I was. You don't hear these things all the time. That's what I think is so great about your show. And crucible. I, I told Warwick on the show, it couldn't be a better word, severe trials that lead this, the creation of something new. All of these people have had this career realization and needed to do something more meaningful that aligns with their intention. And so that's what I'm trying to get out um, with our content, with our show, and just out of these interviews as well. But I don't think yeah. we do as good of a job as I said. Oh, uh, no, you, you guys do awesome. Just one more beat on the back rings. I always love the backstory. It sounds like either or both of your parents must have had some entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, your mom founding, you know, real leaders must have had something. But it also sounds like, you know, I mean, I grew up in a very affluent background. And sometimes people who have had some degree of success, uh, they can kind of cushion their children from, you know, put them in little cotton balls, what have you. And sounds like, you were, you know, challenged, you know, whether it's athletically or what have you, that sounds like, you know, we don't have to get into all the details, but it sounds like there was some things maybe they did right in the sense of just challenging you and not just making, do you know what I mean? Like they had some. Yeah. Know. Yeah. And again, everyone has their own crucible, right? right. And everyone is, is different. Um, my, my, so my mother did not found really, she's now the president okay. um, and she is married to the founder, uh, Mark. Okay. So that, okay, I came up. But when I was growing, in high, growing up in high school, they weren't together at the time. My mom actually okay. didn't have a job. Uh, she lost it during the economic recession. Okay. Uh, my parents are divorced. And so, um, and I also had a lot of you know pain growing up with my brother, not going over to my father's house growing up. Right. Um, so th I think it was 
really, like you said, Warwick in the show, like you had a reputation to hold, you know, you didn't want to go out, you want to be exposed. Right. So that was who I felt I had like those expectations on me, a lot of pressure because of my older brother's habits and reputation within the community. Um, So it was a pretty difficult upbringing. I didn't really notice as much at the time as you grow up, you kind of realize things a little bit later, but I think that was definitely a crux for kind of what made me go out there and try to be involved and show our community that, Hey, look, you know, the Edwards, you know, family can really contribute and, you know, be a a big staple in this community as well Um, Mm -hmm. to the teachers, to the faculty, to anyone that maybe have heard different and we can make a change. And so, you know, I don't like to speak too much about my brother because I know he's going through a really hard time right now. And, you know, he, he's, uh, you know, he's doing incredible things in terms of his recovery. So, um, but at that point in time, as we all know, family members that are struggling with addiction, um, it was very difficult to hold the family together and put on this face to, to, uh, you know, friends and family members and coaches. It sounds like, you know, we all have challenges in life, but it's, you know, for you with your crystal experiences, it motivated you to go in a positive direction to contribute, to capture people's stories that people doing good. I mean, we're all formed again. We don't need to talk more about background, but it sounds like all those experiences help form your values and who you are and what motivates you. Is that a fair statement? Would you say? Yeah, I, I would think so. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So let's talk about kind of, um, with real leaders and what you do. I think you've talked a bit about this, but what are you passionate about? What is it you say, you know, this, this feels, this is my calling. This is Kevin Edwards calling. Cause it sounds like some people don't know, but I'm guessing you're one of these people that actually know you have a sense of mission and calling in terms of what you do. Would you say? Yeah. Um, my intention is definitely to have the most meaningful conversations that transform lives. Gary, I told you I got one lines for a lot of different things. That's it. And that actually comes from a lot of trying to, I was trying to do a lot, a lot of why workshops and really peel back those layers of Mm. what my North star may be. And it wasn't until I read somewhere that, you know, maybe I should reach out to other people to affirm actually who I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I wrote down my five statements. What makes me unique? What makes me unique? This, 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 and that. And I got a lot of funny things that come back. Oh, it's that deformity in your chest. You know, that sticks out. You know, that's what makes you unique. Oh, it's the ability to have these conversations with people. Oh, it's your, you know, trust that you've Mm -hmm. you know installed within our family and that you reach out to them. So all these things kind of came together. And I really realized that at the core, it's just that I like to have actual meaningful conversations with people that will hopefully transform their lives. Hmm. That's what I find interesting. And I realize that because I, I eliminate everything else. I don't watch a lot of Netflix. I don't watch a lot of shows. I don't go out and really do anything. I'm very focused. And I write down on my whiteboard every single week, that intention. And how is that going to manifest in three different aspects of my lives, in my work, in my family, and with my friends? Wow. Meaningful conversations that transform lives. I and mean, it's hard for me to think of something better than that. I mean, that's that. I mean, I mean, at a relatively young age to have your North star locked in. Um, we spoke about uh, on your podcast that you're nothing wrong when you're in your fifties or older trying to figure out is life all about success. It's about significance. Certainly you're living We define a life significance as a life on purpose dedicated to serving others. Clearly, that's what you do that, what you do. I don't mean to be flippant, but you've got that box checked, right? You, I mean, what could be more of a life significance than having meaningful conversation to transform lives? So at a relatively young age, you're already leading a life of significance. It can take some people in their 50s, 60s, or it's never too late, but as I often say, you don't want to be on your deathbed saying, I think now's a good time to turn the direction of my life. Right. Sooner, no, I, is, yeah. sooner is better, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think for some people, we tend to overthink things and we tend to try to be somebody that we're not. Look, I mean, I did these interviews not to, because I didn't think I'd have a career in interviewing. I just 
didn't really realize it was something I naturally liked to do. And that just came very natural to me. And it, it, I really feel like I'm in that flow state when I'm doing them. And so uh, I, I, you know, sometimes when we're trying to think about our company, we're trying to think about our why statements. It's like being in the inside of that beer bottle, right? Mm -hmm. You're in the inside and it's nice inside, but on the outside is where the label is. And that's why you need people to talk to, to tell you, Hey, this is what makes you unique. This is kind of how I see you. And then where the overlay is, I believe is where you truly can, can be living. Absolutely. And, you know, by, by being so clear that ask you that, that helps you ask, you know, great, great questions. I mean, a lot of business leaders, as I've mentioned, they don't really think the action men, action women, they're running a mile a minute. And it's not so much they're trying to be bad people, uh, but it's so often, you know, they're not really in touch with their values, their beliefs, whatever that is, what they feel their calling is. You know, um, I've done a fair amount of executive coaching in the, in the past, and I'll often ask this question that sounds flippant, but it's not meant to be. I'll say, so tell me about your values and beliefs. And I mean, very few leaders will say, oh, I don't have any. I mean, mm. you know, I mean, you don't get to be a leader without some, you know, some foundation somewhere. And I'll say, so to what degree do you feel like you're living in your values and your beliefs and your professional and personal life? And sometimes you'll hear, you know what, there's kind of a bit of a disconnect, to be honest. I just really, I don't do enough reflection. I'm just too busy making decisions. And so then I'll say, ask with a straight face, because as a coach, you're non-judgmental, and I certainly try to be. So I said, what would you like to do? Would you like to change your values and beliefs to better align with what you're doing corporately, professionally, you know, corporately and personally? Or would you like to change your personal and professional life to more uh, be in harmony with your values and beliefs. And it's pretty clear to me, I mean, most people, what are they going to say? No, let me change my values and beliefs. Well, most sane people aren't going to say that, but you have to ask that, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so I guess the point of the story is in you using your words by having meaningful conversations that, you know, that help transform lives, just by asking that one question, what are your values and beliefs to what degree do you think you're living it? I'm just asking questions. I'm not judging them. They're judging or assessing themselves. Right. And so right. it's using different language. I feel like that's kind of by asking questions, you know, uh, so I'm sure what matters to you? What's the goal of your organization? How do you feel that changes the world? Do you have any problems? Let's talk about your team. I mean, all the kind of questions that I'm sure you would ask that helps them think and reflect, right? It helps your guests think, huh, we're doing well, but could we do better? Mm. Not just in terms of profit, but in terms of our mission. Does that make sense? Like, because that's your way of thinking, you're going to be asking questions that do transform lives. Good questions help transform lives. Does that, I don't know, sort of long-winded response, but does that make sense in terms of what you do? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, really started out with those social entrepreneurs. So what's actually been difficult for me is to go into this leadership realm, maybe where you guys are mm -hmm. and have these conversations about leadership. What, what are your values? How do you go in? Whereas I started right. out with what's your intention? What, what social or environmental problem are you trying to solve? How do you leave? How does that affect your employees and your retainment? All these, all these different things, right? Um, but I think, you know, your position is very unique. You're almost like a therapist in some way. And I know from, from my podcast, you never know who's going to show up on the opposite side of that screen or next to you. They could be having a bad day. You could do all the research you, you want on them, but until yeah. they're in front of you, you really don't know who's going to show up. So I think what you do is, is a very special job and it def definitely takes a, a special person to and that's, relate to them. That's one of the reasons why we say, we try to go a certain amount of time, 45 minutes, but we mm. let content, not the clock dictate because it's right. just what you said, Kevin. You don't know not only who's on the other side of the microphone, but you don't know what their stories are going to be. And, and, and you don't know, you know, one of the things that we try to do, and you probably saw it on the form uh, that we have all guests fill out, is we don't want to know too much information because to know everything, you know, we've all been on podcasts where they ask you, here's the 10 questions that I'm going to ask you. And it's like, okay, well, there's no, there's no spontaneity there. And with 
with too much preparation can come a degradation, I think, of the spontaneity that leads to those moments that you're talking about, those revelations that, right, the best place all of us have asked questions for a living, the best place to be is when someone says, hmm, I haven't heard that question before. I once interviewed, when I was a reporter, I once interviewed Dick Clark. Okay. And I asked, I asked Dick Clark, who on American Bandstand for like 40 years would, you know, it's, it's got a great beat and you can dance to it, right? That was, that was, his, that was his, his gig. I asked him if he danced and he said to me, no one's ever asked me that question. <laughs> I was flying for three weeks after that. The idea of being able to ask someone a question where you're really paying attention, that's the kind of thing that makes what you're doing when you say that your focus is to, to, add, to, to ask questions that help change people's lives, that, that's part of the payoff, is listening and then responding in a way that, uh, that, that offers a question that, to your word, Kevin, is a bit of therapy sometimes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I'd agree. I think the best interviewers are the best listeners, no doubt. Um, I also find myself trying to avoid the leadership. I like to just know who the people are. Mm -hmm. Are they funny? You know, how do they react to certain questions? Are they super tight in business like this? They only talk in, in business terminology, you know, so there's all different types of people that come on the show. Um, and yeah, I will say the interviews that I do prepare more for are the ones that are more formal and I don't like as often. They're not as free flowing. So yeah, it's kind of a tough balance, but again, you know, doing so many interviews on the cuff with no preparation at conferences at um, right. you know, just on, on the road with no preparation, being young, you have to get over that fear real early on and just trust yourself in those interviews. And I think that's part of the reason why, um, I've been able to stick with it. Absolutely. Um, you said something earlier that I'm curious about. You started off doing social entrepreneurs and then this real leaders, you also interviewed just, you know, regular business owners and executives, uh, Talk about that difference, because I would imagine with the social entrepreneurs you're implying, you're going to be a cause, you know, inspired person. You don't become, a, you know, a social entrepreneur without this burning desire to make a difference in the world. I mean, you have to have that. Otherwise, why would you do that? So have you what kind of differences have you found in interviewing regular leaders for what want of a better word versus social leaders or social entrepreneurs right well, well what is a real leader right we ask that <laughs> question at the end of every show right yeah there's not one definition there's not right. one right answer so i think the overlay between kind of where we are is that 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 crucible moment is that career transition because all the social entrepreneurs we've had on had traditional careers worked mm -hmm. for big four you know went to really good schools and kind of had that, again, that spear in the chest moment. Um, so that's kind of where we started. Um, I'm always trying to push myself and push those boundaries to say, hey, let's get someone on um, Paul Stamets, a mycologist, right? I, uh, I interviewed this, um, you, I don't know if you know who this is, Akon, he's an artist, he's a big yeah. time performer. Yeah, I interviewed him a couple of times, you know, that's, let's stretch you know, my experience out to those levels, uh, doctors, those are the hardest, right? I speak on their level is very difficult. <laughs> uh, gone to the opioid epidemic. Um, I've, I've covered a lot of different people. So always trying to stretch myself. The process is very much the same, but with those interviews, you just got to listen a little bit harder. So when you think of your ideal real leader guest, what is it you're looking for in a guest? You know, I'm just, I'm not looking for anything. And I hate, I know that sounds cliche, like, oh, he doesn't really mean that. No, I, I, I used to be, look, I used to look for something. I used to look for, you know, that person that I could really see myself. Uh -huh. But hmm. the more people you have on the show, the more you realize just how different everybody is. Their backgrounds, where they come from, how they see the world. And the impact economy, the CEOs are not your stereotypical CEOs. They're really not. They're not time star. I mean, they are time star, but they're not like pushy. They're not. They're very genuine people. If you went to an impact and I'd invite you both to our impact awards, if you go to this awards conference, 
you'll see people, you know, in plaid shirts with Patagonia vests mm -hmm. on, you know, the type of quirky people who are all multimillionaires and CEOs, but just have an appreciation, you know, for the outdoors, for people, for what they're actually doing. And I'll never forget one of my first, not one of my first interviews, interviews but uh, it was one of my first years of doing it. I asked this guy a question, you know, waste farmers, what do you do? And he was kind of taken back by that, actually almost offended. He's like, you know, that question, what do you do? It's like, it's not a good question. We tend to, as society, really, you know, break things down into one sentence or one thing about what we do, who we are. And we put labels on things. It's like, that's not what we do. So, you know, I had a long with an answer kind of for kind of why they're doing what they're doing. And I'll tell you, that was the last time I ever asked somebody, what do you do? <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> I'm so. tempted. Did you ask him, so what, what would have been a better question or... I'm curious to know what is it, who, who are you or what do you value? I wonder what his ideal question would be. Just tell me how you got into this, you know, okay. how are you doing what you're doing? This, you know, this waste farmers, you're collecting soil to regenerate the soil. Why is that important? Where's the money in this? You know, and then you kind of start to peel back kind of what he actually does. But, you know, I, I think sometimes as interviewers, we don't do a good enough job of asking the right questions. We ask right. a lot of cliche questions. I'm a culprit of it. You know, we all right. are. And it's really just trying to dig a little bit deeper and listen to them a little bit harder, which I, again, I think you hit on you know, the nail on the head earlier on. Yeah, it's interesting. So it sounds like you're not just about interviewing your average corporate leader, you know, real leaders. And I love that tagline at the end, keep it real. I'm assuming you want to know the real person, what makes them tick, their values, their passions, what drove them to do what they do. You, you don't want just to hear a spreadsheet. You want to hear who is the person? Is that a fair assessment of what you're trying to achieve? Absolutely. And I think uh, I don't personally have a definition for what a real leader is. I think it's, I think it's someone that can create these meaningful connections. Um, and if enough connect, people are connected, then inherently you kind of have a movement, but what is real is what is imperfect to me. Mm -hmm. And I've really realized that it's like, here we are, look at all of us, we're wearing blazers. Like, why are we, why are we wearing blazers? We're on our home, right? I at least have a t-shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> so what is imperfect? And I think yeah. in crucible leadership, you have to lower your guard, right? You yes. have to be vulnerable. You have to, be yourself in in today's day and age to be that next generational leader you've really got to connect with people in a personal way because everyone's on their phones everyone knows who you are but they really especially people millennials they really want those connections with those leaders and want you to recognize them as well as a as, an, as a human being I mean, one of the things that we didn't realize when we or that we were worried about when warwick started the show Mm. Was, okay, people don't talk about failure much. That was sort mm. of our organizing construct. And then we sat down and said, where are we going to find guests? <laughs> if people don't talk about failure much and Warwick's unique because he talks about his failure and setback, you know, with the takeover bid that, that didn't work, you know, how are we going to find guests? And here's the beautiful thing that we found. It's been not just, it's not been easy to find guests, but it's been it, not nearly as hard as it was. And, and the thing that we discovered that's so um, great about it is that regardless of what the circumstances of the crucible may be, as I've said, not many people have, have lost a 150 year old media company at a price of 2.25 billion with a B, which is 4.7 billion in today's money, but we don't go there often. Um, not many people have done that circumstantially, but emotionally, those crucibles feel the same way. And that's, you know, that's, that's where the realness, you know, when I think of real leaders, that's one of the things we've discovered in doing this show is that it takes a real leader to come on this show and talk about the, their most painful setback and how they bounced back from that and how they're living life now with their eye on their legacy in a life of significance. And it, it is amazing. We've interviewed, a very diverse group, diverse in terms of gender, background, race, as well as type of crucibles, everything from uh, abuse to business failure, uh, marriage, um, physical injury, you know, Parkinson's, 
Navy SEAL who's paralyzed in a training accident, every kind of crucible you can think of. Mm. And they all have something in common. They refuse to lie down and, and just while away the next 30, 40, 50 years of their life. They uh, often lean into their crucible, uh, like the Navy SEAL I mentioned, I think I mentioned on the po- on your podcast, who uh, you know, lives in San Diego, where I think you mentioned uh, you are, and um, ended up uh, you know, becoming exec director of this uh, clinic for vet that has some of the top technology anywhere in the country. Well, he's using his pain, again, it's an oft-used phrase for a purpose. And um, so all of these folks we've interviewed, there's a commonality amongst all of them. I mean, a lot of the time I'll say, well, I almost apologize because what I went through financially was devastating and my sense of self and self-esteem was devastating. But I feel like, well, I wasn't like physically abused. I didn't become a paraplegic, almost like, well, I'm not my crucible is not nearly at the level that you went through. And every, all these people, when I say that, will say, you know, your worst nightmare, your worst experience is your worst experience. Yes. They don't judge you. It's not like a competition who has had the worst life. They don't judge you, right. all these people. And we've interviewed, you know, 50 plus. So there's some commonality. And I feel it's fascinating. And it, it, obviously, you're podcast is called real leaders but yeah i sense some of that what you do is similar like i think you've mentioned off air about trying to align people's skills with their with their values um helping people before they get stuck i mean some of the language and thoughts you have there's some similarities don't you think in terms of what your heart is for the leaders you talk with yeah, plenty. And, and, you know, I'm actually developing a new course right now called Impact RX and the Impact Prescriptions for, you know, well, I guess our dream customers, 28 to 36 year olds who are what we say are stuck in career paralysis. Mm-hmm. So the Impact Prescription is a cure for that paralysis and breaking down that impact into six different things intention, model, profitability, accountability, customers, transformation, impact. In this as a course, a lesson, you know, for people that really feel unstuck. But I th- also, you know, Warwick, the, the, there's so many crossovers, right? As we found out today. But another one I think is this success versus significance. Mm-hmm. But for us, it's short term versus long term. Mm-hmm. If you're someone who wants to have a significant life, you're not thinking about the short term right here and now. You're thinking about the long term. So for these impact organizations, they're thinking seven generations down the line. Will our kids be able to live in this planet? You know what I'm saying? When the price of oil increases and distribution costs go up, what's that going to do for our economy? Mm -hmm. Let's focus on local now. So there's a lot of world problems that uh, I've been exposed to through these interviews. poverty, you no know, hunger, health and well-being, the SDGs, um, water shortage, again, the opioid crisis, mycelium uh, decline. It's the, you know, with, with the roots of fungi, right? All of these different things. These leaders are taking a stance. They've found their purpose. They've aligned it with this intention. And they're thinking in the long term and ways to solve these problems. That's why I find it so fascinating. I mean, what I find encouraging is, you know, some folks talk about, well, you know, first part of my life, I'm going to, you know, be successful, then I'll have enough money. And yes. maybe, maybe I'll have enough money to do, start a nonprofit or join a few nonprofit boards. Maybe I can do that in my 50s or so. But in the meantime, let's, you know, I'll work my way up to be partner or whatever it is. And I don't think it's an either or. And I, I guess... Mm. You know, I, I I try not to be judgmental, but I have a different perspective. I think all of life should be significant from grade school or frankly, or earliest memory on. You could have a life of significance in elementary school. You don't have to wait till you're 40, 50, mm. 60. And, you know, you'll have to make choices. It doesn't mean to say that you leap, you know, leap off the partner track at your law firm or your business, but, you know, maybe just to pick law for an example, maybe you're a lawyer and it's like, you know, maybe I'd like to get into environmental law or nonprofit law. Well, maybe you might not make as much money as you would in corporate or tax. 
Uh, mm. Maybe use part of this example on your podcast, but and it's not wrong. It's not a right or wrong decision. Just be intentional. Maybe as part of what you're, you know, how does it align with your values? If you feel like, no, I honestly feel like I can make a big impact in the corporate area by, you know, meeting with some of these CEOs and having a discussion and, you know, meaningful discussions that impact others, you can make a, a case for that. But do it because you're being intentional. And if you say, look, I'm going to make a lot less money being a nonprofit pro bono lawyer for folks that can't afford it. So long as that's your decision, that's not a wrong decision. Mm. If that's what you want to do. You know, maybe your parents might not understand. Maybe your friends might. But if that's what you want to do. So, yeah, I mean, I, does that make sense? I feel like young that's people. That's no work. You know, I want to hit on this point. Please, I want to keep going on this point because what I've found is like, you know, everyone says, oh, do what you love, do what you love. I don't really like that quote mm-hmm. as much. But I will say work no matter what you do, does give you a purpose. Yes. So when you think about where I was at that time, interviewing all these social entrepreneurs, hearing their stories of you know these crucible moments, like I was 40 years down the line and mm-hmm. my kids and wife left me, you know, and because I was so focused on growth. We shouldn't be doing this. And so you hear these stories and you think about that inception point about when people are actually going to start their work. And we have these career fairs where people come in, they flash all these shiny objects at you. Come work for my company. We've got, you know, beer on Friday or come work for my company. We've got, you know, this cool office. It's not the way to go at all. So I I think we've got a big problem here on our hands. And I'm glad that, you know, we're talking about today. Well, and I'm glad that that's, you know, with your new course and other things that that's on your Heart, because you know, as, as we've said before, you don't want to be on a deathbed going, boy, I, I blew it. My kids are, don't mm-hmm. know me. They've had all these issues in their life. And, um, you know, you, you don't get that, you don't get that life, life back. Um, you know, that was certainly, I mean, I've said a lot of things I've done wrong, but, you know, just because I grew up in such a large, uh, wealthy family and media business and was around, you know, uh, ambassadors, prime ministers, even folks from Hollywood. You know, my mother was incredible at throwing parties. So even Hollywood folks would come out and say, boy, you know, Lady Mary Fairfax throws parties on a level that we're not used to even in Hollywood. So that, you know, she had not so much because of the money, but she had a sense of style and uh, she was actually on the top 10 best dressed women in the world list way back in the day. So she, <laughs> she, was, she was quite something. Um, But uh, so I got to meet all these folks and I just, a lot of them just had empty lives and their kids and I never wanted to be that person. So I was fortunate I could spend time with my kids who are now all in their twenties. And what's interesting and, you know, it's something for everybody to think about on birthdays, what have you, we write cards, we say what we most value about the person whose birthday. It's just a tradition we've done for many years. And my boys, who are the more athletic ones in my family, every single time they'll say, well, dad, you were always there at our soccer game, our tennis game. You were there. For many, many years, they've said that. I can't tell you how much that means to me. So all that's to say, I mean, my whole brand, if you will, is about all the screw-ups and the stupid decisions I've made. So if anybody wants to know all the dumb things, I may go to crucibleleadership.com and you'll you'll hear all, all of the bad, stupid, idiotic Hey, you're stuff. doing my job telling people to go to crucibleleadership.com. <laughs> the reason I say that is you don't want to be that young guy, that young woman with the divorce, with the kids that hate you because you were never there. Oh, you're doing well, but I don't know. To me, this like a judgmental moment coming up on if you're going to get married and have a family, honor that. If you don't want to spend time with your kids and wife or husband, then don't get married. Don't have kids. But if you make that social contract, so all that's to say is you get the idea is life's about choices, is having that whole life where you feel good about what you do. You're not abandoning. I mean, some people even abandon their families for the so-called um, good cause. I personally don't believe in that philosophy myself. I think you can do both, right? You can be successful and significant. You can work on a good cause and have a decent family. So anyway, I guess that's a, a bit of a discussion. No, no, no. Does a that strong, make sense? I guess I, I focus point. especially on young people of just 
yeah. getting these points, don't go for the shiny object. Even if the shiny object is couched in some socially good um, goal, mm. it's great. But you don't have to sacrifice your whole, you can do both, right? You can do good and have a good family. Does that make sense? Well, guess who's a, a big factor in that job decision, you know, as a college student? Hey, mom, dad, I just got this job off today. What do you think? So yeah. parents are a big influence. And so all the parents listening to out, out this, you know, to this right now out there, what I went through was difficult. And Gary, this is actually what we talked about before the show. And yeah. this was, you know, I had this career with real leaders and I took this pay cut to go work for them. I got offered a, a few other different jobs in Chicago, again, the shiny objects, mm -hmm. high paying salaries. And I took this job because I knew when I was working at an insurance company the year before, a big insurance company, that I'd go home after that work day and focus on real leaders on those interviews. And I knew that this is probably what I wanted to do for a long time. And a lot of people don't have that. And so when I joined in work, I think actually we're more similar than you think. <laughs> when I joined my, my mother and stepfather's company, you know, my father did not respect it. Right. And so I was back home, you know, in, in college or from college after I graduated living yeah. with him, trying to tell him about the excitement, what I'm telling you guys. And it was just over the head. And here's right. a guy that was at my football games every time. Right. Yeah. Was my biggest supporter, you know, growing yeah. up. And for the first time in my life, when something I really like and really wanted to do, there's zero support. No questions, nothing. And that was very difficult. Oh. That, that was probably my crucible moment. Taking a, a step back and going, all right, got to make a decision here. Got to do what I love or, you know, succumb to, you know, this pressure with my father and potentially damage the relationships. So and and one. not pursue the purpose that you felt you were being yeah. called to, right? I mean, you felt your soul come alive yeah. as you were doing those things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and since then, um, you know, it's actually pushed me to go harder and harder and farther and farther. And since then, now he's come on board, and it's just been the best thing. And he's my guy I go to now to have those conversations that I can't have, you know, with my mother and my stepdad because they are they are my business partners. Right. So it created this interesting dynamic yeah. where we're now closer over here on this forefront and I'm closer on my, with my mother and stepfather on this side could, because we interact every day about the business. So it's this interesting parallel, but it took a lot of time and a lot of nurturing and it's still a tough process. Let me tell you. Yeah. I, I want to just focus on what you just said because listeners will be everywhere from twenties through I don't know, 60s or beyond the courage that, and I'm, you know, serious about this, the car that Kevin had, uh, it's easy. I mean, you're obviously somebody that's bright, that uh, is focused uh, in any corporate career, you're going to get it done, do incredibly well, and you go up the ladder because you're focused, driven. Those are the sorts of things that, you know, corporate CEOs and vice presidents, that's what they want when they're looking, you know, for folks to fill the pipeline of the best and brightest and, high achievers or whatever else human resources calling it. So you could have done that and been very successful, I have no doubt. But yet you chose to follow the calling in your heart. And to me, you know, the road less traveled, you picked, from my perspective, the right choice. Why is it right? Because it was true to who you were. And anytime you pick a calling, a profession that's true to who your inner values, your inner calling, this this, you know, still small voice, whatever you want to call it deep within you, being true to yourself is always right. That's always the right call. So as you can tell, you know, other young people this, you can save them a lot of a lot of misery. And yeah, I, I, I mean, an ideal world would have supportive parents. And in my case, it wasn't so much they were not supportive It's just, you know, as I mentioned on your podcast, it's like growing up in the royal family. For me not to go into the family business, it would have devastated my father. I would have crushed it. I mean, I, I couldn't have done it because I, and, and, and the thing is having a, a media or a newspaper 
in which you're trying to uplift society wasn't like it's wasn't like it's such a bad mission. It just wasn't my mission. But you know, again, I'm not perfect with my own kids. I'm hyper focused on not telling them what to do. I want them to live into their gifting and calling. Um, but I don't care what they do. I don't care what they earn so long as they're happy. Now, sometimes, uh, I don't know if I mentioned on the podcast, maybe I have, it'll come back to bite you. Uh, faith is important to me and faith is like, important to all of my kids. Well, my daughter is, uh, is the, the fearless entrepreneur, if you will. I don't quite where she gets those genes, but I'm, I wouldn't call myself fearless at all. Uh, but, you know, she said to us one time, well, I got this opportunities to uh, work with Samaritan's Purse, a fantastic uh, faith-based aid organization, anywhere that's poverty or turmoil in the world, like in Iraq when, you know, Mosul was being sieged and that whole deal, they were out there giving people food and water outside Mosul with the refugees leaving. I mean, that's about as dangerous a place on the planet at the time, a number of years ago. So they're really out there, admire what they do. So she said, well, you know, I'm, I'm being given the opportunity to have an internship in, in the Congo. You know, it's a very dangerous place. And then a year or so later, fast forward South Sudan, again, one of the most poorest nations in the world. And there's been turmoil forever for a variety of reasons. Well, what are you gonna say? No. And she was over 21, so no, it wouldn't have helped. But, um, you know, where people have faced, so it's not like it's not like we disagree with her mission, right? Not that it matters. We agree with the mission. How can you say no? Right. I mean, because you'd be a hypocrite, right? She's doing what she believes in, and the icing on the cake is you happen to believe in it too. <laughs> you just wish it wasn't so dangerous. So I don't know. I mean, it can come back to bite you when you uh, try and live this out. But all in all, it is a good philosophy for parents, and I want them to really hear what Kevin has said, is support your kids' calling. Forget about the numbers and the career, and if they do what they love, it'll sort itself out. So your parents need to hear that, and those in their 20s, you know, they just need to have the courage to, I don't mean to reject your parents, but just do what you feel called to. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, and, and the young adults need to listen, too. They, they need to, yeah. you know, they cannot reject your parents' opinions and thoughts. Right. That's another thing I took a long time for me to learn and say, oh, they're right about a lot of different things. Well, that's true. I mean, there are some folks, anybody that's older than 40, by definition, must be wrong. Well, sometimes you can learn from other people's mistakes. They're mentoring. How do you do things? In my younger days, I mean, it's easy to, when you're young to get into this, I'm going to share my truth, throw in the hand grenades and machine guns, and I'm speaking my truth. Well, you can speak your truth, but try and do it a little bit more diplomatically first. You don't only have to go in there all guns blazing. You know, yeah. that's typically a mistake early on that you learn later on. But um, I'm going to show that I listened to my parents when I was younger, <laughs> that if, if I had something to say that I thought was relevant to a conversation to say it, and that is, I believe the, the sound we heard was the captain turning on the fasten seatbelt <laughs> sign. It's about time to land the plane. Not quite yet. We have a couple more things we need to do. Um, the first thing, Kevin, I would be remiss if I did not give you the opportunity to let our listeners know how they can find out more about the Real Leaders podcast, about Real Leaders, about you. Yeah, I appreciate it, Gary. Yeah, uh, Real Leaders podcast. Uh, just go on. It's on every listening platform, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Uh, just search Real Leaders podcast and you'll find it's a red logo. It's Real Leaders with Kevin Edwards. Uh, you can also find more information at realleaders.com. Uh, it's real-leaders.com. Also, if any of you listening out there are impact organizations right now, we've got the impact awards going on right now. Um, we do a great job of, again, bringing those companies that are in the dark into the spotlight through our publication, through all of our media resources, and many of the CEOs come on the show as well. So that's another another outlet. And then, of course, the uh, the course is launching here in May. So coming up here about three weeks, I got to get up my butt, get going on that one. But uh, we're pre-selling it in May, and then it will be uh, fully available for everybody online in June. Awesome. Um, I've got one more question and then I'm going to go back to Warwick. But you said mm -hmm. something, Kevin, in the, uh, the the form that we had you fill out that uh, for 
And the question is one that we ask everybody. Uh, what in your professional estimation are the key principles and tangible action steps that can help people in the midst of a crucible move beyond it? And this is uh, your response. And I'd love you to unpack it a little bit because I think it, to Warwick's point, we try to offer hope to people here. And I think what you say here offers a lot of hope. Yeah, yeah please you remind say, me what I said. <laughs> you say, understand who you are, where you want to go. And I love this line. And whatever gets in the way becomes the way. Unpack that a little bit for folks. Mm. Right. Yes. Uh, the obstacle is the way. So if, if things um, are, are roadblocks in your life, let's take, for instance, um, a relationship um, that you need to patch up, give that person the call. Um, if your room is messy, clean it up. If there's <laughs> things that you are not getting done for your organization, get it done. Stay disciplined. And you're going to find that life's going to be a lot easier for you. So I think anything that comes in the way, we recognize that. And a lot of the times we just, we think of it as a bad thing when in reality, it's exactly what we have to do. So you yeah, understand who you are and then, you know, the obstacle is the way. Absolutely. Work. Wow. I mean, that is so profound. That's very crucible leadership like. It's the, also the, very stoicism gets. like. Is that a are you a big fan of the Stoics? Because I've, I've yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's so, uh, Marcellus uh, Aurelius, yeah. 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 We, you know, it's um we had somebody on the podcast actually, was it Joe Badaracco in um uh there was Step Back. Was it in that book? Um I think he mentioned that. And um, he was also in the movie Gladiator, at least his character was. Not Joseph Badaracco, but- no. the, the, Marcus, yeah, Marcus Aurelius, <laughs> right. the emperor of Rome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, funnily enough, but um, yeah, so- here's the, here's the caveat of yeah, that. Yeah. Is the part we don't talk about is the part you have to eliminate. What are those toxic relationships in your life? What are those things that are taking away time from you? Netflix? Mm. HBO, uh, alcohol, drugs, staying inside. Those are the difficult things and those are the obstacles. We've got to avoid those and eliminate those from our lives and eliminate everything that isn't in our intention that isn't going to get to where we're going. And again, we're all human. We're all flawed. It's not going to be perfect, but just realizing those things when they happen, I think is half the battle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that's very... Um... That's very profound. The what gets in the way becomes the way. That's what we say on crucible leadership. That sometimes crucible experiences um, they can be clarifying. Maybe it's I shouldn't I should never do this again. Or coming out of your pain can be a purpose. Like the Navy SEAL uh, who was I mentioned was paralyzed and now has a clinic in San Diego. Um, I mean that's really the core of crucible leadership. So. Um, I guess maybe one last question is you've interviewed a whole stack of people and real leaders. What would you say is the biggest lesson that you've learned from interviewing all these people? Biggest lesson learned. I think it's the one I shared earlier is that you just, you never know who's going to show up on the opposite side. Um, all of our guests have had amazing lessons that they've shared along the show um, and there's always something you can take away from every single interview. But I, I think really just for me personally is just you can do all the research you want. You can do all the preparation you want, but you really don't know who is going to show up on the opposite side. So I hope today's interview was good for you guys and being the, the guest this time around. No, absolutely. It was fantastic. I, I, I had a great time. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank and so I much. have been in the communications business long enough to know when the last word has been spoken on a subject. And that was it. So the captain, uh, the, the plane is indeed on the, the tarmac, on the runway, on whatever it is they land. I get this wrong all the time because I'm just not an aviation guy. But before we go, um, I, I usually do um, some takeaways. And I wrote three down. And then the more we talked, I'm like, well, we're emphasizing this one a lot. So I'm going to stick to one takeaway for you today, listener, from, um, from our conversation uh, today. And that is uh, something Kevin said and something Kevin's lived. Um, and 
we call it a crucible leadership soul work, but mm-hmm. it's finding out what your unique gifts and passions are. Kevin arrived at what he calls his North Star and what Warwick called when he was talking about it as his calling by mm-hmm. doing that soul work, asking others what made him unique, taking a hard look at his skills and vision, and it led him to his life's purpose, having meaningful conversations that change lives. Ask yourself with input from others, what's yours? What's your purpose? And then get after it because that is, in crucible leadership language, your life of significance. Thank you, listener, for spending time with us today. Uh, If you enjoyed this conversation with Kevin Edwards, uh, we would ask you to um, uh, subscribe to the podcast for sure, but but share it with your friends. Um, Post it on social media. Um, Let people know about it because the more people who know about it, and Kevin's a great example of this, he drove all over the country, interviewed social entrepreneurs, sleeping on holy air mattresses. And now he's got a podcast with a, with a large platform where he is making a difference. So as you share it with people, it helps us get more people exposed to the content here. And if you like the content here, hopefully you'll want to see that happen. So until the next time we're together, we ask you to remember this, the crucibles in your life are real. They're painful, they hurt. They can knock you off your feet, but they are not the end of your story. In fact, they can be, if you learn the lessons of those crucibles, the beginning of a new chapter in your story. And that new chapter can be the best chapter in your story because where it's going to lead to when the last period is put on the last page is what we call a life of significance.